Bryce, what are you doing? Trying to, you know, game. <laughs> what? This game is really hard. Pac-Man? Uh, yeah. Dude, you're supposed to be playing the game for next week's episode of Arcade Bookshop. I mean... Uh, I will. I'm really close to beating this. Right. And what about the book? Huh? We're supposed to finish a book for the podcast, too? Oh, yeah. I finished that last week. Yes! Oh, did you finally beat it? Uh-huh. The first level. Oh, boy. You can listen to new episodes of Arcade Bookshop every other Monday on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you get your pods. You'll always find us with a controller in one hand and a book in the other. Today we are covering the erotic crime oh. fiction novel Coming on the Boogeyman by Dick Chiz. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Are you yeah. excited? Oh, yeah. You you can't tell because I'm sitting down and underneath the table, but yes, I am. You are very aroused. <laughs> Arousal in the morning. Wait. That's the other episode for the other podcast. What podcast are we doing? I think we're doing the Drunken Pen podcast where we're talking about becoming the boogeyman. Wait, this is the DPW w podcast? Yeah, not, yeah. Not the DP podcast? Yeah, yes. Fudge. Yeah. So, fam family friendly? Uh, not, not particularly. No. Mm, my brain's kind of mm. scrambled. Uh, what's the other one I do? Arcade bookshop. Yes, yes. That one's not dirty, right? Uh, no. You guys seem pretty cleaned over there. Clean shaven, clean bums. Maybe a curse word every once in a while. Mm, not uh, really, though, huh? I don't rightly remember. If anybody's cursing, it's probably me. Yeah, that's what I was trying to think. Yeah. When does the DP podcast air? Uh, those are on special times at special nights on special channels. Mm. They and don't. They normally don't last long, so they don't get tracked. Right. So it's coming on the Boogeyman erotic reimagining, mm. or yeah. what is that? It's like fan fiction. Mm. Did I write it? You may. You might have it. I think it was like your more to that and uh, Fifty Shades of Grey and Twilight and mm, all that. Right. Yes, right. Yeah. That was your. Magnus du Dookiness. <laughs> Magnum Dookiness. <laughs> Magnus Dookie. Uh, okay, so let me, uh, we'll take a break, and recalibrate. We, we get, gather ourselves here, get the right notes. Change the gears, <laughs> change the settings, get things ready for the, the DPW podcast. Put out, put out the candles. Put out the <laughs> candles, put away my fine, I guess I can leave the fine cognac. Yeah. Cavassier. Cavassier, <laughs> yeah, the fine Cavassier. All right, folks, well, we are covering. Becoming the Boogeyman. Becoming the Boogeyman. By Richard Chismar. Yes. Not Dick Chiz. No. Dick Chiz is, uh, Net Gallery's gonna <laughs> love me, by the way, when they see my review of this <laughs> book after this intro. <laughs> You are listening to the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Caleb James. With me today, Spencer, the Maryland Mustache Mender Church. You're mending mustaches that have been defiled or just messed up, I guess. You know, they accidentally get, you know, somebody's cooking in huge fire. Mm. Some of it gets burned off or, you know. So uh, you're doing the Lord's work. The Lord's work, yes. Fixing damaged mustaches. I, I tell people when to and not to have mustaches. Mustache. Today we are discussing the book of the month. What is the book of the month? Becoming the Boogeyman by Richard Chismar. We actually got an advanced reader copy. We did. First time that's happened since the other two times that happened right before that. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm looking at another advanced reader copy of All I See is Violence. and mm -hmm. Actually, I think Boogeyman came first, didn't it? Came like a day or two before. I think so, yes. And we also had advanced reader copies back in the day for a bunch of comics. Yeah. But this is the first big name book that got sent right. away. And we did not peruse any sites trying to garner any kind of uh, 
attention or anything to get this. Uh, the publisher just was like, hey, you guys covered this book last year. Yeah. Want to do it again? Right. Yes, we do, because we we're actually going to do it anyway. Yeah, that was the plan, and we just didn't have to pay for the book. <laughs> Which was kind of nice. <laughs> yeah. I was down for that. Anytime I don't have to pay for the book and get a free hardcover edition, right? too. So, Spencer, what is Becoming the Boogeyman about? Why don't you tell me, good sir? If I can find a synopsis. So, Spencer, back in the summer of 1988, it's a long time Ooh. ago, one can say almost 36 years ago. Yes. It's like 34 years ago. Mm. 30 something years ago. 30, yes, and w- 35 years ago. Let's stick with 35. No, that's way short. If it's within the 70s? I'm 37 years old and I was yeah. born in 86. Yeah. So 1988, if my math oh, is 80, correct. Oh, 88. I thought, for some reason, I thought you said 78. I was like, there's another, like, another decade that we needed. Back in the summer of 1988, when Eight. people still knew how to do math, yeah. a young Richard Chismar was catapulted into the center of a living nightmare as the serial killer Joshua Gallagher, dubbed by the media as the boogeyman, stalked his tranquil Maryland town. A lot has changed in the intervening years, Spencer, as this book shows Mm -hmm. and not always for the better these days chismar enjoys a certain level of celebrity and notoriety himself being the only person who an incarcerated joss gallagher will speak to on or off the record chismar likes to believe that he's doing the world a public service by visiting gallagher in prison as there are plenty of other nameless victims out there who gallagher might finally admit to killing and bring closure to grieving loved ones and a dark rhythm and routine begin to take hold but Chismar eventually finds there's a price to be paid for dancing with the devil when a masked figure with all the hallmarks of Gallagher's reign of terror from 30 years ago now leaves a horrifying calling card in front of Chismar's home. And it's clear there's a new player on the board in the ongoing game that the boogeyman controls. Oh, that is a good, tasty synopsis. So last year, as we said, we discussed chasing the boogeyman. Yeah, Was that last year? Yes, it was. Okay, I I remember, I just couldn't, you know how the years... Have, the math, have, yeah, yeah. I, I know, your brain, mush. Mush, mush. mush. You're, it's the stuff they feed reindeer now, <laughs> just mushy acorns and stuff. Chasing the Boogeyman, I went into that book not doing any research, and nope. I'm so happy I did. So here's the spoilers for everybody. Uh, as you got our wonderful introduction, there is going to be spoilers galore. We're going to spoil everything. Everything. And Chasing the Boogeyman, well, that might not, since it's not a new book, you might not, you might be fine with those spoilers, but Becoming the Boogeyman just dropped October 10th. Yes. So as a recording of this just a couple weeks ago. So I would understand if you want to, you know, read the book and then listen yeah. to the episode. I highly recommend you do. So at this point, uh, we will be spoiling chasing the boogeyman not becoming the boogeyman just yet i'll give you a warning Mm -hmm. before we do that so if you read chasing the boogeyman what was most interesting to me about that book besides how well written it was and how fun as fun as a sort of serial killer true crime story can be uh was the fact that at the end there's an author's note that the whole thing is fiction yes but when you read it going into it the way i did with all the police photos and Mm -hmm. the photos submitted by the author and everyone seems real, and all the events seem like they actually took place, and you're like, holy shit, I really want to research this, but if you were like me and did not research, you get to the end, and then you're blown away by the fact that this was all fiction. Yes. Based on Richard Chismar's imagination and just people from his life. Mm. So there were some people that he knew, some people he made up from cobbled together people he knew, but it is a work of fiction, and it was a lot of fun. It was about him as a young kid, growing up in this nice idyllic town in Maryland and there is a serial killer afoot and it turns out to be one of his classmates, Joshua Gallagher, who at the very end, Richard, who's now a writer, uh, goes and meets with and, you know, has a conversation with. And then you find out that there is going to be another book. I actually yeah. did not know there's going to be another book. I, I There was a hint, obviously, right. but I was not sure. I didn't think it was coming that soon. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it, it hasn't been that long since Chasing the Boogeyman's came out. I don't know when the debut of that was. I just know we read it last mm. October. I don't know if it, I don't think it came out last October, right? No, it, it was out for so. a while. Probably. Yeah, I think it was out for a little bit before then. So that is the end of our discussion of Chasing the Boogeyman. We'll probably go back and talk about some stuff from it. But now we are going into Becoming the Boogeyman. So if you want to tune out to read the book, this is your opportunity. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Yep. 
So Becoming the Boogeyman picks up where the last book pretty much leaves off. I mean, it's some years later, but... Like real time, yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah we're modern time, 2022 yeah. is when this book pretty much takes place. So Joshua Gallagher is in prison. They caught him in, I believe, 2018 or 2019. 2019. Yeah, because yeah, because they they don't find him until uh, advanced like DNA testing. Yeah. So for a long time, they don't even know who the, they didn't know who the boogeyman was. Yeah. So he almost had like a 30 year reign of terror because he killed other people. Mm-hmm. So in this story, uh, this does unfold more like a work of fiction to me. Yeah. Though I will say. Even knowing what you know about chasing the boogeyman, it would be great if he didn't have that author's note, the first one, because yeah. then he could have read this one. And be like, oh my god, this is crazy! Right. But I would say it only took me a couple chapters just to get completely lost and immersed back mm-hmm. into the story. Like, okay, even though you know this is a work of fiction, you're like, this is this could be real. I could yeah. suspend my disbelief and be real. And 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 it does the same thing that the first book did with with having photos of different of the different victims and things like that. And the thing that I always liked is either like the. Uh, uh, the interview sections or like, you know, a clip from a thing or something that they always had. Like a message end, board or something. At, at the end of each chapter. I, I always liked those things. Uh, that was always one of my favorite parts of both this and then the previous book. It adds a lot of realism to the story, which I really like. So before we go on, because we usually do this at the beginning, your official rating. Now, I looked last year and I gave Chasing the Boogeyman a five out of five whiskey yeah. shots. What do you get? Well, I don't remember what you gave it. I probably gave it a five. I too. think you did give it a five. So, what do you give becoming the boogeyman? I'll probably give it another five. Give it a five. I gave it a four. That, that I can see that. I would give it a four and a half if I could, but we don't do half shots yeah. here. But uh, four or four and a half, you could say either way. I have reasons why this wasn't a solid five, and it mainly had to do with just the very ending, how tidily it got cleaned up mm. pretty much like how like the ending gets like it's very long and drawn out this whole story because it's almost like real life yeah like how these real crimes you watch one of those crime documentaries and they unfold very slowly and then you get like a big hint of evidence and then there's a big rush of stuff mm. and then all of a sudden you know it drags out again mm. it's written just like how those really happen but at the very end he wraps everything up in a nice bow mm. And then you're like, ooh. And then we're beyond spoilers. We'll we'll get to, yeah. But at the end, we go into there's going to be another book. Like, you know, there's going to be another book. And I, while I'm happy there's going to be another book, I'm going to buy it and I'm going to probably love it. I was a little, it was a little on the nose. It was like one of those things like, okay, because the way this is written to be like a real story. When you get to that end, he's like, oh, come on now. Yeah. But I am interested to see how it unfolds. But we'll get there. Well, and also, because, like, this one didn't have, like, the, um, like, how the first one was this book that took place in the past. So this is stuff that he's already wrote. So this is all things going in the present. So, like, the the actual writing of the book, you're just, like, who's telling, like, you know, obviously it's still him telling it. Because in the book, he hasn't put out a sequel to Chasing the Boogeyman. So it's just kind of, like... How am I like? How's this story being told? He's yeah. He uses utilizes uh, a few very interesting storytelling methods. For one, like you said, he uses excerpts from prison interrogations. Uh, his conversations it's in the style of almost like an interview. Uh, he has message boards. Which that that's one thing I want to do bring up that I like that I did like in the very beginning of the book as kind of like the prologue or to keep you like to uh, c- catch you back up was like clips and things and stuff that was in the previous book yeah of like of the interviews and things to just giving you like the the pressure take on recap yeah and then i think like i said when i told you i think the last couple things were new things that wasn't in the previous one yeah but i i just thought that was a interesting way to kind of you know as far as recaps go it was definitely a better way to do it because a lot of them you're like even if it was a couple years since reading the last book you get kind of not bored, but you're just like, all right, I know this stuff. But this was done in a way it's like, oh, I want to read it. I want right. to, you know, see what's introduced and what was uh what happened before and how he discusses it. But the other the main storytelling device that he uses that I really liked was that in his universe he created here, it's the real world that we live in. Yeah. But alternate world. So he did everything Richard Chismar has done, but Chasing the Boogeyman was a book he wrote. At, right after this hap- happened in the original. Yeah, like it's an old book. Yeah, and then it actually gets 
when they catch Joshua Gallagher, it catches steam like almost 30 years later. And then everyone's like, oh, shit. And they read the book. It becomes popular. They make a movie. And then his publisher wants him to do a sequel. So he's actually writing Becoming the Boogeyman yeah. as you're reading Becoming the Boogeyman. Yeah. It's very neat how he does that. And I, I just really enjoyed like the storytelling aspect of it. He still does a very good job in this one of bringing like that almost Stephen King nostalgia of childhood. Like He's really good at that. Like The first book, the charm of it was that Edgewood... It is a real place because that's where he really grew up. Yeah. But it was it seems real, mm. like the actual way he's telling it. Uh, he goes into you know little anecdotes of when he's a kid and stuff. And in this book, he does the same thing, and it's actually broken up into a new book he's right. writing. So you get excerpts from this new book he's writing, which is just about his childhood. And it's a good framing device where it breaks up the boogeyman story in a way where you get like, oh, here's like the innocence that you need. Because Chasing the Boogeyman had the innocence of just, you know, they were kids. Yeah. So this has the innocence brought in because now it's modern times and they're adults. He brings it through recollection from his childhood. I really enjoyed that aspect as well. And I actually would like him to do a book of Edgewood when he's a kid. Right. Because it, cause he said those parts were like real memories and mm. stuff. So when you read those, like when he saw a witch, quote unquote, dancing in like a victorian house when he was right. a kid you're like well, i want to i yeah. want to read that i want to know about his childhood because he did a, such a good job of that and like and he just always writes in such a way that it's just it's easy like you know and, and it's weird because it's not like he's using very simple words or anything like that like he's using com not complicated words but you know he's like normal words but it's just i don't know somehow with the way he does it it's like it just flows it's almost like the um you know, like the the thing we give no game in. Yeah. When you're reading something like it, it just I don't easy know. reading. Yeah, it's like the pacing's good. At least in my opinion, the because I saw some people thought this book was too dragged out. I didn't. I like no. the pacing, and I like that almost every chapter makes you like cliffhanger style makes you want to read the next chapter. Right. It's one of those books you just can't stop flipping through. Yeah. Like I I told you, it took me because I looked about twelve days to read this. And I was, I was so busy that I only was able to read it in like 10 minutes here, 10 right. minutes there. But last night I got like an hour and I read over 100 pages and mm -hmm. finished it. So you can easily knock this book out, a 400 plus page book in maybe two hours if you're a right. moderate speed reader. Right. Like you don't have to be a, you know, read very fast to get through this book. Same with Chasing the Boogeyman. And that, that I think a lot of that actually just goes with the pacing and the style it's written in. I do have some caveats on this, but before we get to that, do you have any other things you wanted to mention about, uh, you know, like the storytelling aspects or like we talked about the nostalgia. I also did really enjoy uh, the kinship of his friends. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like later on when they bring and his personal relationships, yeah. I thought were really fun. I and, thought, and the one with his kid, too. I mm -hmm. liked his son, Billy. I, I think he did a good job of like if this actually happened, like how it would actually play out. You know what I mean? Like there wasn't too many like outlandish things or or something like you know what I mean? Stuff that you wouldn't really believe wouldn't yeah. happen. The most outlandish things goes into my caveats list. So I guess we could bring that up now. And it's funny because in Chasing the Boogeyman, I completely overlooked it until I read reviews. And yeah. by that point I was so sold on the book I didn't care what the right. reviewer said. But in this book I was very aware when you go into detective work and like the cop side of things in the last book, what was goofy, if you really think about it, was like, oh, Richard Chismar's doing a ride along with the detective in yeah. the murder case. No, he wasn't. Like, especially when he was a teenager yeah. or young 20 year old college yeah. kid or whatever. It's like, no, he wasn't. Like, they, that doesn't work. They're not coming to Richard Chismar as a kid and giving him vital information. Yeah. That's done very uh, overtly in this. And this one, he is directly involved in the investigation. The cops are constantly, I mean, shit is happening yeah. to him. But at the same time, a lot of it seems a little far-fetched. Not though, too far-fetched. I, I feel like it's handled better in this one, though, because, like we say, like... He's involved in the he, actual case. He, he's involved in it and in that he also has made a connection with the lieutenant who is working the code case who figured out that it was Joshua. How How... Gallagher. Gallagher. Well, the problem is, like, he brings his friend Carly Albright, who's made up, who wasn't yeah. a real person. He brings her in. She, you know, she was in the first one. Yeah. And I love their dynamic together. That's what made the first book so fun. But, like, the cops have no problem that someone that's not involved in this case is immediately yeah. reading letters that were for Josh or, True. Yeah, yeah, for Gallagher. And 
it, it just kind of didn't make sense. Like, that wouldn't happen. A lot of the stuff that happened in this book would not happen in a real investigation. So this one definitely is solid fiction. Yeah. Whereas the one, the Chasing the Boogeyman is written as a true crime novel that turns out to be fiction. This one is just actual fiction. Right. So as long as you keep that in mind, it's a lot of fun. And and honestly, I look at it as like any way of like, it's like if you're watching any like cop show or movie, stuff like that happens, you know, yeah. all the time too. So they're, they're devices and tropes that are used in crime dramas and they generally don't happen in real life. Mm. This toes the line pretty good because a lot of the ineptitude of the police department and a lot of the sophistication of the police department both shine. Yeah. So when the police department you know, blunders and misses obvious things that happens for real. Mm. But then when they catch something and the, you know, in this case, Richard Chismar, who thinks he's in really deeply involved, turns out that, oh, they didn't even tell him about this. Right. It's like they, you know, they do keep you at a distance, even though it seems like he's really involved. So they did, a, he did a good job of making that realistic. I was like, the, the, the one thing then that I would probably go that I kind of rubbed up against that would deal with that stuff is like, some of the like the shady shit that he shouldn't have done that he would have got in trouble for that like, started to get a little ridiculous. Yeah. Like he gets uh, two um, COs fired from the pol- the prison, like uh, the correctional officers. Like he had one like smuggle a phone in mm. and like shit like that to get Gallagher to talk to him in private and like stuff. Like, you would have got arrested. Yeah, like it doesn't matter if you're you know solving the case with mm. them. Like, you would have got a fucking arrested. Like, you can't be doing that, you yeah. know? Yeah, because that was going on, like, years prior to the, you know, before, yeah. before the, it, it did, the the stuff in the story happened, like... Yeah, so that, that was a little ridiculous. There's also another main plot line that I really liked it at first. There's a guy named Henry Metheny who turned out to be a serial killer that Richard Chismar also was involved with when he was a kid. Right. And he never told anyone. And that one... It gets a little squirrely and maybe shouldn't have been in there because it's, it it takes the story to unbelievable levels. Like he just has these uh, yeah. relationships with serial killers. Like, but this one almost like tried to attack like, him, yeah. and then he didn't tell anybody, and the guy went and killed a bunch of women. You know, he was like a young college kid, and he was and, working and, and stuff. And he felt guilty because he felt like those deaths were yeah his all fault on him. That's yeah. why he wants to talk. Tries. Well, that's what he says. The it's his motivation for did, trying to get Gallagher to admit who else he killed. Yeah, but at the same time, it seemed a little far fetched. And also, Gallagher was a lot smarter or conniving than he should be portrayed as. I think because he's like, even I think he even brings up, he's like, you know, he thinks he's a Hannibal Lecter type when it's, yeah. he's he's an idiot. But then he's like, he is like very conniving because he has this really elaborate plan that comes to fruition yeah. at the end. You're like, no, the fuck yeah. he didn't. At least I did like that the people that were involved in his little cult following people that were involved in this were boobs. Like they were just they were actual morons. Oh yeah, yeah. So he like, was totally just using them. Yeah, so that was realistic. But the fact that Gallagher all of a sudden seems to be smarter and he becomes almost a parody of a criminal mastermind right. character. When in the first book he's just played as a regular dude who's yeah. a serial killer, you know. So that did, gets a little ridiculous, but at the same time, I still enjoyed it. Mm. So like that that part is not even my caveat because, like I said, as long as you take this as fiction, that's just a fun story. Then. Right. But there were a few things that actually what knocked it down a star for me. I don't know if you felt this way. Uh, one, he mentioned Stephen King way too much. He did, yeah. I mean, to the point where I was like kind of goofy. Like, I don't know why, because Stephen King's not in the book as no. a character or anything. And like he mentions that, you know, he wrote some books with them and stuff. Mm. Fine. Yeah. That's fine. But then like he brings them up a lot. He's always like my good friend, Stephen King. Yeah. It's like, dude, why do you keep saying that? <laughs> and, like Stephen King has nothing to do with the story, but he just kept bringing them up. So I, I thought that was weird. And always was Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's Stephen or Stevie. I just was like, did you lose a bet? And then like his, <laughs> his dog, I don't know if it's a real dog, but one of his dogs name's Cujo. Like yeah. that's a fun way to do that. Like yeah, you have right. little, you know, Easter Because that's eggs. something you could really like, he, he might actually have yeah. like, a dog named Cujo. But never. the fact that he kept just mentioning Stephen King, I was like, wow. I, uh, so I, I did not like that the, after like the fifth time I read mm. it, it was like Stephen King and I was like stop bringing them up and you think they would have got more like video cameras for their house well that got a little ridiculous because like they kept seeing the fucking guy on their property and then they found out he was breaking in and there was a lot of stuff that got into, you know Goonies level ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> like they, they, they him and uh, Car- uh, what was his name Carly Albright they go to the, like they they break the clue you know yeah. they Scooby Doo some shit yeah. don't tell the cops about it 
And then they go to this fucking house and they find like these things that were stolen from Chismar's house and basically did a outdoor B and E. Yeah. They broke into somebody's property kind of and like all this shit and he gets a scolding. And it's like, no, that was a fucking felony what you did. Yeah. And he became too much of a character and investigator in there. True. But again, that's not even a part that was one of my caveats. Again, just fun story, you know, crime fiction. But what 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 got on my nerves? So we mentioned the Stephen King thing. That was like a simplistic right. thing. I get it. He got he at one point he gets bashed in the head, right? Yeah. He gets like a bunch of fucking stitches. And then for like the rest of the novel, and I'm talking like a hundred pages, he's just swimming all the time. His head's swimming. Yeah. He's fucking lightheaded, or he's blacking out, or like his head weighs is a is a lead weight. Mm-hmm. His head's a fucking anchor. His head's a concrete block. Like Jesus, mm-hmm. dude, fucking just take a nap or yeah. something. Like I get, maybe maybe not take a nap. Maybe I don't know. It's like I get that his head hurt, but fuck. And then he gets beat up a bunch of times too, and he's just he like he does get whooped on a good bit. And it's always like some woman or somebody saving him. I was like, come on, man. So I didn't care for the fact that the fucking repetition of his head being damaged. I noticed it, like this goes into the writing stuff. There was some writing elements that seem. I don't know if this book was rushed to finish, mm. but near the end is when you got a lot of like the repetition with the head stuff, some phrasing like or similar phrasings that come up, like the way he describes something uh, came up a bunch of times. And it, it just seemed like the second half was uh, written faster maybe. and maybe with less care. So from a writing standpoint, I did not. It w- it wasn't enough to take me out of the story, but it was enough for me to notice. Where I was like, "Come on, like, what? What? Come on, don't stop saying that." Yeah, stop talking about your fucking head swimming or you know, like the smell of something, and you repeat it five times. Like, not not necessary. Also, some of his interactions as the story progressive uh, progresses gets a little. They get a little. I don't want to say goofier, but uh, non genuine. Mm. They don't read as genuine. Like when he like a lot of his sappy moments where he has tears in his eyes oh. and he's you know omitting something to somebody because he does that to like four different women, yeah. <laughs> like his wife, the cop, Carly, um, fuck, uh, no, I guess not his mom because she was not alive, but he yeah he he always is omitting some secret or something he does and or omitting that is his faults and it's trying to make him more of a relatable make you like him more because he did some stupid things right. in there. Uh, and he keeps calling himself an idiot. He does that about 30 times. Like, oh, I'm just an idiot. And they're like, yeah. yes, you are an yeah. idiot. But some, a lot of the conversations didn't come off as genuine. They came off like a script. Hmm. Again, not bad in a way that it's like, oh, I can't read this anymore. Just just enough for that I noticed. Right. It's like, okay. And again, most of that was in like after the second half. Like I'm talking like the last 100, 150 pages maybe. I don't know if you noticed any of that stuff, but it just, uh, I don't know. I think it could have been done a little better. Trying to see if I can find any examples. I think one of the best uh, sideline characters, I forget the detective's name, but this is Detective Gonzalez with the mustache. Yeah, with the mustache. Like, and like, maybe this goes in your because he always talks about like how every time he's around, he just can't help but just like look at the mustache. He's like memorized by the mustache. Why do you think you went with the Marilyn mustache mender today? Yeah, uh, I actually did not put that together at all because I'm so stupid that I didn't even <laughs> think. Like, I did like he was always like fixated on his <laughs> stupid mustache. Yeah, but just like a lot of these interactions, I just didn't. They they could have been a little better. Like the side characters' interactions are mm. fine. Like when they're interviewing different people and things like that. It's just like when it's Chismar himself. I don't. I, I'm gonna imagine it's probably pretty hard to write yourself sounding genuine. True. Because you have to be like, okay, what would I say in this mm. instance of an event that I've never been in and would right. never be in? How would I? How would I go about this? It just, it's like I said, not bad. Just you know, it's I, almost like when you watch one of those Hallmark movies, and then like the dialogue, you're just like, mm. that's a little too, just a little too much, too on the nose, a little too sappy, just a little too this or that. Or sometimes it was just almost like, because you know, I'm not a big fan when people do accents, uh, over the top accents or uh, slang or anything. Like they mm. go too hard into it. Yeah. But just a little bit of a natural way of speaking would have been because everyone just sounded like Richard Chismar writing their dialogue, like the yeah. cops. And- yeah, because you figure w- where he lives at, even, you know, he still lives in Maine, so you figure there would be a heavier accent. Maryland. F- or Maryland, you know, yeah, for, for some people. But that, I think that was really it as far as my critiques. I, I really like the... How we talked about like the interviews at the end of the chapters. Yeah. I really like like the... um. 
the especially the ones between him and Gallagher. Yeah, their exchanges were pretty those, good. Those are really good. And like what I liked about them is that they really showcase what I think Chisma has a talent with like dialogue. Yeah. Where there's no, you know, he doesn't have to worry about explaining all the, you know what I mean, of like a normal, like. I think where a lot of his dialogue fails in the actual story is when he's trying to make it natural by mm. including like details between the dialogue. So it's, you, you know, like, hey, don't do that. Uh, she said as she was smacking her head on the wall right. or as she was, you know, wailing her hands in the air to cry. Like that actually goes into another gripe I did have. He broke the cardinal rule of writing more in this than he did in the Chasing the Boogeyman. Every writer does this, by the way. But And again, I, I mostly noticed it in the second half. It was a lot of I felt or I feel or uh, I smell or I see. Like, just don't just show us it. Don't yeah. tell us it. Like, it was a lot of telling and not showing. And that's where I kind of got the feeling that maybe he rushed through. Because he probably did, like, you know, Chasing the Boogeyman was so popular. Like, oh, write a yeah. sequel. And, he you know, he went through... Because the way this is written, even though it reads very easy, putting this together was not easy. Oh no! And in the author's note at the end, he like talks about he did all the pictures. Yeah, mostly like they he was in a lot of these pictures. Like there was a body sheeted up and it was hanging from a tree. It was Chismar. Yeah. Uh, so like a lot of this was actually him doing it. So I would imagine the writing of this couldn't have been easy to put it together this way because it does it is broken up in a lot of different framing devices. Would after reading this, would you would you see a Chase and the Boogeyman movie? Fuck I, yeah, I would. I think that would be so weird. Like how they would like how would you play it? I think they'd have to play it straight. Like like they would have to just it's just just a movie. Yeah. Like this. I mean, would you they think could it, do like, it as a true documentary? I think that would be cool to do it as one of those like uh like the shows Mindy watches those yeah. fucking murder mystery documentaries where it's like this is real yeah. but just do it as you know obviously it's fiction or, or do you do like what they do in the book like you play it straight throughout the movie and then like right at the credits or whatever then be like this is a fictional thing yeah. based on like you know just a <clears throat> well they could easily do that because how many people are actually going to read the book true people be googling like you know oh, who the boogeyman well i don't know seeing the boogeyman so the, it could definitely get away with that and then you know have the sequel is just whatever but I would definitely be down with that. It would be a weird movie because even though those shows are like an hour or two long, because sometimes they have more than one episode of the same crime. Right. It, it, I don't know. It's just the way it is. It's not really a lot of action. They have some reenactments, mm. but mostly it's just people interviews. And But this, you know, these books are written with a lot of action. Yeah, that's why like, I think you'd almost maybe would have to go the other way where it's just like a normal movie. Yeah. So you can play on the suspense. Because so, like, especially in that first one, there was a, well, even in the second room, there was a lot of suspense. Yeah. And, and trying to, you know, the figuring the things out, like the cat and mouse game. The only way you could make it work, I would think, is if you had a narrator. If you were trying to go like straight adaptation. Uh, yeah. Like chasing the boogeyman. And then it would have to be because... We can't, how would we, if it's supposed to play, be played as real, we can't see the guy's memories, you know? True. We can't see anything from 1988, so it all, it would all be reenactments. And then do you go realistic reenactments or you go hokey? You have to go, yeah. they always go hokey. Right. They're not real. So I don't know. I'd be interested to see how they'd pull it off if they did it, but, uh, a limited series would probably be better. Yeah. A limited series would be cool. But I, I mean, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to read the third one. So yeah. the, the most major spoiler alert at the very end, which is the ending was very contrived. That's that's mm. mainly the thing that knocked the star off for me was it's wrapped up super fast. So you go through, you know, well, I think they try to do that because they know that this uh, there's more coming yeah. down the pipeline. But you get about 300 and something pages in and they are no really they're not really any closer to figuring out who did this or who did what. And then all of a sudden, when he actually did have the shittiest thing, he had a gotcha moment. Yeah. He had the fucking, oh, and then I was playing chess and, you know, I'm just a pawn. Pawn. Yeah. Pawn. And a then very, all of a sudden his brain explodes with information and he remembers everything he couldn't remember. A very, like, shake, or, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes kind of. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. That's the answer. And <laughs> even it, it, it was so, it, that was done very shittily. I'll admit yeah. that. Because he's having this heart to heart with his wife. He's about to admit the biggest secret he's yeah. ever admitted to her. It was so fucking schlocky. And he uses the word pawn. And then all of a sudden it sparks the, the information he needs at the exact moment he needs it. And he goes, oh, we'll have to finish this later. I'm sorry. I have to go and save the world. Yeah. And it's like, oh, dude, he got the info. And it did. It did. It yeah. wraps everything up. And he goes. And then you find out it was the mailman and the fucking 
some old crack whore. Yeah. And then it's working for, and then they did, he throws in a little thing where he gets beat up again. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. But then the twist, the there's twist. another twist. And this is where it got, kind of got shitty. This is where it wasn't shitty. It just, it, it made you go, really? Well, I think at this point, you kind of know, like, what's happening. Throughout the whole book, I was thinking, is this going to be how this ends? And it did. Joshua Gallagher escaped from a maximum security prison under, even though he's under 24 hour watch and all that. He somehow escapes. And you're like, oh no, there's going to be a third one. <laughs> but though, though, like I said, I don't know. Maybe I just, I'm, I'm just too much of a, like a homer, but like, I, like I see the criticism, but also too, like when I closed that book, I was like, I want to read it. I was like, fuck yeah, third one. Like, <laughs> Um, of him just being on the loose, just murdering right. people with a fucking cult behind him. Like I'm like, yes, sign me up. Most of my critiques on this book could be summed up by maybe Chismar specifically went into this and leaned into this with a schlockier attitude. Like, yeah. okay, the cat's out of the bag. Everyone knows this is a work of fiction. Now. Right. So now I can, I can ham it up. Can embellish a little bit. I can and... do some fun crime tropes yeah. and, and it works yeah. because it's, you know, it works perfectly for that. It's just, if you're trying to keep that realism intact, right. you can't, it gets too stupid. But if you're looking at it as just a fun crime story, mm. Perfect. Right. Well executed. It, other than the gotcha scene. I didn't like it, that. The eureka moment. Yeah. Fuck off with that. It it does stress the uh what's the um they always use it for like uh for like comic books, like the realm of possibility kind yeah. of thing. Like like this one it puts a little bit more strain on that than the first one did, but it's also different. It's a lot different with it being a past to a present book. Like I so. would say it breaks that strain at the end. Though. Yeah. Like it rips through that realm of possibility yeah. to ridiculous this level is. at the very end. But I'm thinking the third book's just going to be straight fun then. Yeah. Not played as real at all. It's just going to be go for Just go for it, hopefully. Because yeah. like I said, even though you know that this is a work of fiction, a couple chapters in, you're sucked right back yeah. in. You're like, okay, I can believe this is real. Right. Like, I can believe this is really happening because it's written so well. And, and it's also weird at first because, like, that Stephen King just had a movie come out from one of his short stories called The Boogeyman. So when I first read that, it took me to be like, wait, no, no, that's Stephen King's bo- like, movie. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, wait, are, are they making a movie about this? Like, you mm. know? Is this like Richard Chisma's like sly way of trying to convince a studio to like, hey, make a movie of the first book? <laughs> like, I don't know. That'd be interesting to see how that comes to fruition, though. But I, I do like um, after the first killing, there's paparazzi and news people. Yeah. Like, there just has to be like a vacant lawn across from the street. So they I post that there. I I I like that aspect. I felt like a lot of that. Kind of like right, right. I like true. that he actually made it modern too, where a lot of them were TikTokers and stuff. Right, yeah. Like, you know, crime TikTokers mm. and YouTube channel people. So it wasn't just straight, you know, I mean, he has TMZ, but it wasn't just straight news people and yeah. boring. Like, he did a good job of modernizing this and making this seem like the real world that we live in, which probably one of the first, if not the first book I've I've read that utilize Facebook, TikTok, you know, it all the even, social media. It even, it even brings up uh, COVID a couple of times. Yeah, it brings up COVID. I, he did a very good job of like, okay, this isn't done in a, like a silly manner. Mm. This isn't done in an unrealistic way. This is exactly how the real world works now. And, you know, he kept having like different message boards or here's a Twitter thread of people mm. being shitty towards yeah. him and looking at him like he's a fucking asshole. Most of the book is just him being portrayed as an asshole by the media <laughs> yeah. and then the public. So I like somebody, that. Somebody who's just trying to make money off of other people's misery. Yeah. So that was kind of almost endearing. I like that. So did you have any real critiques of this? I mean, I know you're less critical about writing than I am. Yeah. I mean, the, the stuff that you bring up, I, yeah, I, I can agree with a, a good chunk of that. Um, is it enough to actually knock you down a star rating? No, I don't believe so. Because like I said, I enjoyed it too much. Like, yeah, I think if it didn't have the Eureka moment, and if I was, uh, if I had the time to just read this in two block sittings, yeah, I probably would have rated this higher. Because the one thing is when you have to like stop, stop a lot and, stop, and go yeah. back and read, it makes you a little more critical than you normally would be because you're not as absorbed. Mm-hmm. When yeah. I read fiction and I can just read for a couple hours straight. And you get to immerse yeah. yourself into it. Yeah, I am not looking at a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. So like I said, this can easily be for me a four and a half, even a five uh, if the ending was slightly different. But 
It's like a solid book. I really enjoyed it, and I would love uh, for us to get the third book to read. <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe talk to Mr. Chesmar, too. Hey, Mr. Retro Chesmar, I won't call you Dick Chiz. Can you come on the DPW podcast to discuss your next book, please? Please. Uh, but I did read some uh, reviews, and a lot of people said that after reading Chasing the Boogeyman and this book, they are going to read everything he's written. Yeah. Like, they are really sold on Richard Chismar. And I can see it. Mm-hmm. I could definitely, if he's doing a true crime like this, uh, I would really like to see how he does, like, horror and tackles well, other uh, genres. See, I can let you borrow those Gwendolyn books that he co-wrote with Stephen King because the first two are really short. The The third one, it, it's like a full-size book. Mm-hmm. But again, as you, with his writing, mixture of him and, and Stephen King's writing style, it's not a hard, like, you know. He seems, I don't know if he was heavily inspired by King's work, but, like, his writing style-wise, but he definitely does have a bit of King in the way he writes some, mm. I wouldn't even say, like, the characters necessarily, but kind of how they engage yeah, and how he goes about his stories. Uh, at least as far, you know, I only have two books as a sample size, but... It does seem that he takes away some of the more positive aspects of how mm. King goes about storytelling. Right. Uh, so, I would, like I said, I would be I'd love to see how he does horror, sci-fi, well, you, or any sure other. He was growing up in the '80s and stuff. He was probably reading a lot of that stuff, like you know. Yeah, and he, you know, he wrote Cemetery Dance. Like he started Cemetery Dance, so he was a horror guy, right? Uh, so, I would be very interested to read some of his straight horror work mm. because it's always I don't know if it's just those two guys, but it just seems that. Uh, horror writers are very good at doing crime. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, the Mer- Mr. Mercedes. Like I read excerpts yeah. from that, and it seemed excellent. Oh, it's so good. And you know, like later, I really like. So it's like Stephen King could do crime. Uh, Richard Chismar obviously could do crime. So I don't know. Seems like that's a maybe. It's just the avenues. Like they're they don't necessarily converge, but you know, they're fear, parallel. Like fear, suspense. Like you know what yeah. I mean. You're playing with a lot of the same aspects one in, in different just, ways. One is just more realistic than the other. Some pub, you know, somebody at least gets murdered at the beginning, or there's like a string. You know what I mean? There's death and peril and all that kind of stuff. Yes, yes, yes. So becoming the boogeyman gets a solid four and a half star. Four and a half whiskey shots out of five. We are drunk off of Chismar. Yes, yes. Because uh, I rated it a four. Spencer gave it a five. Uh, that gives it a four and a half. Five. Four and a half. That's fair. And we both get chasing the boogeyman a five. So uh, that's solid. Solid. Real solid. And we are not, I mean, do we do tend to cover books we actually like. Right. For the most part. Mm-hmm. But we are not known to just give straight fives for every yeah, book no. that comes our way. Uh, if you listen to any of our, you know, Mirakami minutes, like we weren't sold on some of those. Uh, we've covered books in the past that were like three stars, right. maybe four stars, but we usually try to, you know, do, at least do the compliment sandwich at most, right. or at least, you know, we like this, we didn't like this, we like that. Yeah. Uh, so I like to at least uh, give a writer their due. Mm-hmm. So if you enjoyed this kind of episode, our next book of the month, and I don't know, we're aiming for November. Probably November of 2028, by the time we fucking finish the thing. We're going to be doing the Divine Comedy. Uh, but I still have to finish. I have 500 pages of Don Quixote I got to read. Spencer's going to go through eight fucking volumes of something or other You're probably right. by that time. I'm done with that. Or I might just start early. Just so. No, maybe just start early, yeah. But we will be covering the Divine Comedy. Uh, I don't know how that's going to go, but at least I won't have to worry about offending Dante if we don't like it because he's been it dead It should be for... interesting. yeah. I don't know. I just don't really know how to tackle the conversation because it's not like most things we discuss on here. Right. But I'm excited for it anyway because I just been wanting to read it. Uh, if you want to follow us on the internet, you can check us out at DPW Podcast. We're on a bunch of stuff. Uh, you could follow Spencer's OnlyFans. He is the Maryland Mustache Mender, doing the Lord's work. Doing the Lord's work. Fixing damaged mustaches. mustaches. I appreciate Moustaches. it. Moustache. Uh, and you can follow me at calebjameskay.com. I uh, finally updated my publishing history after fucking however long. But I actually got some more acceptances and stuff that I can't announce until next year when they come out. So God fucking Yay. damn it. Uh, but I promise you, it's, it's the thing is, it's going to be a slow going affair where when you look back, you're like, oh, here's a big list. Yeah. And you're excited. But individually, post to post, is a long gaps between right. because it takes forever for these fucking books to come out. Uh, so anyway, we thank you for listening. 
And we hope you enjoy these episodes because we have a lot of fun talking about books. And I would like to do that more, but yeah. I don't think a lot of people look, you know, it's very specific. Yeah. It's like, especially if it's a sequel, it's yeah. hard to do a sequel and then try to get people to listen to it when they didn't you know, yeah. read the first one. Uh, so anyway, thank you for listening and we'll check you next week. Hey, Caleb, you wanted to see me? Ah, uh, Spencer, my good fellow. I've been expecting you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so did you want something or... Want? Goodness, no. Require. Require? Yes. I require your services for the briefest of moments. Okay. Surely you can see the predicament I'm in. Well... Actually, no, I can't. I lost my glasses at the pub last night. A pub, you say? Surely you can't be serious. As serious as a fart during a recto exam. And stop calling me Shirley. Rightio. Anyway, if your spectacles were affixed upon your face, you'd see that I, the host of the most prodigious writing and books podcast in the business, has been immobilized by a rather substantial stack of fallen folios. What? My to-read pile finally fell on me while I was taking a nap. But you're on a podcast table. I hardly see how that matters. And you're naked. I hardly see how that matters. Dude, your hairy ass is touching my drink coaster. I hardly see how that matters. It matters to me. Can you just unbury me? No way. Your reckless reading got you into this mess. Blockhead! Wait! Don't go! There's a copy of War and Peace wedged in my taint! Spencer! Can you at least leave me a bottle of whiskey? Hello? Can't get enough drunken nonsense? Listen to new episodes of the Drunken Pen Writing Podcast every Tuesday wherever you get your pods.